So let's start. Um, okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the webinar of today. Uh, the speaker of today is Stefan Pau, and uh, he will talk about uh, dynamics of large scales in uh, turbulent flows. Uh, so let me quickly introduce him as every time, and then I will leave him the stage. Uh, Stefan Pauw obtained a PhD in uh, 1984 uh, at TNS uh, Paris and uh, became professor in 1987. Uh, to set up the activities in experimental physics uh, in the newly created DNS Lyon, uh, acoustics uh, in uh, liquid vapor mixtures, ultrasound scattering by vorticity interment flows, instability in granular flows, uh, observation of uh, uh, quasi crystalline order of uh, pattern forming instabilities, fluctuations of injected power uh, in uh, turbulent flows. Uh, he has initiated the dynamo experiments using uh, uh, von Kalman's swimming flow. In 1997, he moved back uh, uh, to work on statistical properties of fluctuations in uh, dissipative systems uh, driven uh, out of equilibrium, acoustics in foam, uh, observation of the dynamo effect in the turbulent flow uh, of uh, liquid sodium in collaboration with part of his former group in Lyon and uh, CEA and the observations of uh, reversal of the magnetic field, studies of wave turbulence and of the statistical properties of large scales of turbulence. He obtained many prestigious awards uh, during his career, including the CNRS uh, Silver Medal in 2009. Um, he's professor at the Institute of the, uh, uh, so, Institut Universitaire de France Junior in uh, 1992, between 1992 and 1997, and uh, senior in 2009. Uh, he got the CA Academy de Sciences uh, Science Award in uh, 2009, and he is a member of the French Academy of Science since 2011. So, it is uh, with uh, great pleasure that I introduce uh, Stefan Pope uh, for uh, his webinar. Um, so I stop sharing my screen and I give you the stage. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. You, you can see the... Yes, yes, we can okay. see it. Fine, so, uh, so I will, uh, I will discuss today the dynamical properties of uh, large scales in turbulent flows. And uh, it's probably useful to define, to give my definition of large scales in turbulent flows. So I mean by large scales, scales larger than the injection scale. So scales larger than the scale at which uh, the turbulent flow is driven. So these are really large scales, so larger than all uh, the inertial range scale. Uh, so the outline of the, of the seminar is uh, as follows. Uh, I will first show that at least some turbulent flows display uh, equipartition of energy at uh, these large scales. I will give two examples, uh, a numerical one with 3D hydrodynamic turbulence and an experimental one with capillary wave turbulence. And then I will move to uh, the study of the transitions uh, between the different turbulent regimes. I will use uh, an experimental example uh, with uh, 2D specially periodic forced flows. And uh, I will try to, to study uh, transitions between different type of turbulent flows when some parameter is changed. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting subject uh, by itself. So the, the subject uh, which concerns the bifurcations from a, a fully turbulent flow regime instead of uh, the usual framework to study bifurcation, which concern uh, uh, static flows or uh, time periodic or space periodic flows. Here we will try to, to characterize transitions uh, that occurs uh, in fully turbulent regimes. And uh, 
in fact, this, we will see that these transitions are characterized by a different behavior of the largest scales uh, of these flows. And uh, what we will try to, I will try to convince you that uh, these transitions uh, can be can be described using statistical equilibri equilibrium mechanics, uh, which is quite surprising uh, since a uh, turbulent flow is a canonical example of uh, an out equilibrium system. And then if I have time, I will study uh, large scales in the frequency domain. So uh, I will study the low frequency behavior of turbulent flows and uh, try to, to show that uh, one, over, one over F type noise is uh, related to the dynamics of coherent structures in uh, these turbulent flows. Uh, so uh, first, uh, the first question we can ask is, are the large scale of a turbulent flow in statistical equilibrium? So this, uh, the, the picture here is a usual picture people display uh, when uh, uh, presenting uh, turbulent flows. So it's a, uh, it's uh, energy. I have some problem with uh, it's energy spectrum uh, versus a special wave number. Uh, we have. Uh, injection of energy at we have injection of energy at a forcing scale and uh, this energy cascades to uh, smaller scales where it's finally dissipated so this is the usual uh, framework of kolmogorov cascade and it has been studied a lot since uh, kolmogorov and what has not been studied so far or only very partly studied is what happens at uh, scales larger than the injection scale. So at wave numbers smaller than the forcing wave number. So uh, in fact, it, it has been believed by some people a long time ago, even before Kolmogorov. I think that the first to, to claim that was uh, Burgers, that there is a spectrum uh, proportional to k square at a very small wave number. So the idea is just to that the small the smaller scales uh, have display equipartition of energy. So if the system is isotropic, if the flow is isotropic, we have the following relation here between the the spectrum depending on the wave vector f of k and the spectrum depending on the modulus of the wave vector e of k, which is just true when the system is isotropic. And if uh, we have equipartition of energy, the same amount of energy in each mode, this means that f of k is a constant and therefore e of k is proportional to k square, at least for three-dimensional flow. So this is just, uh, for instance, Rayleigh-Gene Rele spectrum for black body radiation in condensed matter physics, or it's just a spectrum of the phonons uh, in solid state physics. Uh, it's a spectrum displaying uh, equipartition of energy. So I just mention here that what we are studying is uh, uh, statistically stationary flow. Uh, we are not studying decaying turbulence, but uh, in decaying turbulence, there is also this problem of uh, uh, the uh, behavior of the low, low wave number spectrum with this old controversy between uh, Bachelor and Safman uh, asking whether the spectrum should behave like k square or k4 in the limit of uh, small uh, wave numbers. So we are not studying uh, that problem 
we are studying uh, uh, statistically stationary states. So the situation is uh, the situation is that it has been believed for a long time that uh, there is the statistical equilibrium at very for the large scales with energy equipartition, but uh, no experiment exists so far. We we are trying to to do measurement right now, but uh, I am not aware of any experimental result and. Uh, some numerical simulation have been performed and I will, I will just present one right now. So it's a numerical study we did with Vasily Dallas and Alex Alexakis a few years ago. And uh, uh, so we, we just forced uh, 3D turbulence with a spatially periodic forcing. So like an ABC ABC flow with a forcing with cosine and sines of space. And uh, we try to, to check numerically whether the scales larger than the forcing scale uh, are a display equipartition of, of energy. So uh, this first picture uh, on the left. Uh, displays uh, the spectrum or the normalized spectrum with respect to the wave number divided by the forcing wave number. So for different forcing wave numbers, which are uh, 10 times uh, from 10 times to 40 times larger than the first wave number in the box. So the upper curve the upper curves uh, are forcing with helicity and the lower curves uh, correspond to forcing without helicity. And in fact, the, the normalization is uh, such that uh, we should have an horizontal line if we have equipartition. So uh, uh, if we have equipartition, uh, since uh, the spectrum is proportional to k square, then the dimensional analysis is enough to, to determine the shape of the spectrum. It should be, it should be proportional to the, the square of the typical forcing velocity and inversely proportional to the cube of the forcing wave number. So what we, what we observe both in non-helical and helical case is that uh, we the, the low frequency behavior? So you you see very clearly here the the injection scale since there is a strong peak at the injection scale. So scales below or wave numbers uh, below the injection wave number uh, display a more or less a horizontal spectrum here compensated spectrum, and therefore. We have, we do have equipartition of energy at the scales for scales larger than uh, the injection scale. So uh, the figure on the right displays the fluctuations, displays the energy flux within the scales. So in blue, you have the mean energy flux. So what you observe is that you have a zero mean energy flux uh, at scales larger than the injection scale. This is expected. We, the Kolmogorov cascade is direct for 3D turbulence. And uh, so above the, the injection wave number, we have this uh, very, very small inertial range in, within our simulation. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, the viscous decay, but we are not interested on, uh, in, on that part of the, uh, the spectrum. But besides, uh, besides this uh, behavior of the, the mean energy flux, 
in gray fluctuations are displayed. And we see that uh, although we have no mean energy flux in the large scales, uh, we do have fluctuations of uh, energy flux. And in fact, uh, uh, the variance of, uh, of the, these fluctuations uh, they behave like the force power of the, the wave number in that range. And in fact, uh, these fluctuations are just related to the fact that uh, two, two wave vectors uh, within the energy containing uh, scales uh, can beat to generate some, uh, to transfer some energy at very large scale, so uh, on a very on a wave vector with a very small amplitude, and in turn, uh, in turn, these uh, these large scales are evolving on a sea of small scales, energy containing small scales, which act uh, as a turbulent viscosity, and. Uh, uh, there is an energy transferred back from the large scales to the small scales. In fact, it's, the situation is quite analogous to the one to, to the one of a Brownian particle, which is uh, which is in fact both uh, uh, driven by molecular collisions, but also because of molecular collisions undergoes some damping. So it's the situation is. Is similar here. Okay, so uh, in principle, we, we therefore have shown that at least for these flows with this type of forcing, uh, the, the largest scales are in a statistical equilibrium with, uh, with energy equipartition. So now I will uh, quickly discuss. Uh, some uh, experiment on uh, uh, wave turbulence. So uh, it, it just consists of uh, generating capillary waves uh, just with wave makers. Uh, and these capillary waves are generated at the surface of mercury. Mercury being chosen uh, for its very low kinematic viscosity. And uh, so the spectrum, uh, the frequency spectrum uh, measured by some capacitive gauge at some point within the flow is displayed on the lower figure. Uh, so we inject, we inject energy at uh, roughly 100 Hertz in a in a quite broad frequency domain. Uh, so the, the paddles are vibrated in a, just driven by a random noise centered about uh, 100 Hertz. And this is clearly seen. So the injection range is, so this frequency range is seen because it, it, it is uh, uh, the range for which the, the spectrum is. Uh, Larger, and uh, on the on the right we have the usual uh, cascade, which in the case of capillary turbulence is direct, as in the case of three D hydrodynamic turbulence. But we observe that we also have energy uh, on the left, so towards the low frequencies, and uh, with some some scaling behavior on half a decade, uh, which is one over F. The blue line represents one over the frequency. So uh, this is not an inverse cascade. We don't expect an inverse cascade for capillary turbulence, as I said. Uh, and uh, the question is, what is this, what is this behavior? So, <coughs> We can, from the advantage of wave turbulence, is that uh, you have a correspondence between frequency spectra and wave number spectra, uh, 
just using the dispersion relation of the waves. So using the dispersion relation of capillary waves, we can see that a one over F spectrum in, in the time domain correspond to a one over K spectrum in the space domain. And so we expect in this problem, a one over K spectrum at large scale for the surface elevation. This is uh, what is measured is the surface elevation. Now, since uh, the energy is proportional to the square of the gradient of the surface elevation, we have a, fact, a factor k square between the spectrum for the surface elevation and the energy spectrum. And this gives an energy spectrum proportional to k. So therefore, again, uh, we, we have energy equipartition at large scales because for this two-dimensional system, we expect that energy equipartition corresponds to a, a, an energy spectrum proportional to K instead of K square in the three-dimensional case as uh, shown before. So uh, with this simple experiment, we, we also are able to display that uh, some, uh, in fact, some energy flux uh, at towards the small scales coexists with uh, a statistical equilibrium at large scale uh, with energy equipartition. So now I will uh, I will move to the second part of. Uh, the talk, uh, which will concern uh, transitions between different turbulent flows, uh, which are characterized by a different behavior of the largest scales of the flow. And uh, I will study this on uh, an experiment uh, on two-dimensional uh, hydrodynamic turbulence. So in two-dimensional hydrodynamic turbulence, uh, we, we know since Kraiknan that there is some inverse cascade. And uh, this inverse cascade, in fact, is stopped uh, by a, a large by large scale friction. And either it's stopped before reaching the, the size of the domain. And then we have just we just observe a turbulent regime, or it's not stopped before reaching the, the size of the domain. And then there is accumulation of energy uh, on the largest scale modes, and there is some uh, condensate as uh, uh, in the jargon of 2D turbulence, uh, some condensation of energy at the largest possible scales. So this is one way to, to describe uh, the large scales observed in 2D turbulence. Uh, but there is also another possible description, which traces back to Onsager, uh, but uh, have been, then has been studied by, by many other people who are listed here. Uh, there, there is also a description of the formation of large scales in 2D turbulence using statistical mechanics of the Euler equation. And uh, these people have shown that uh, uh, the maximum entropy uh, states within this description uh, corresponds to uh, large scale structures. So it's quite surprising because we, we have Two, two explanations for the generation of large scales in 2D turbulence, and uh, but they are based on completely different arguments. The first description is typically related to an out equilibrium system with an inverse cascade. The second description considers a, a statistical equilibrium uh, and statistical mechanics of the Euler equation. So it's, it's quite surprising and 
probably at least at the pedagogical level, it would be interesting to understand more how these very different descriptions uh, finally give the same, the same result about the formation of large scales in 2D turbulence. So I will, I will now uh, describe the experiment we performed and the transitions between the, the different turbulent flows in 2D turbulence. So this experiment, it has been performed a few years ago now during the PhD thesis of Johan Hero. And uh, it consists of a, a thin layer of gallium or mercury uh, seen from above here. Uh, and uh, the flow, where the flow is forced by a, a, a current uh, driven through a periodic array of electrodes. So if we, if we look at the picture on the side, uh, see the current is injected within the fluid layer through one electrode, and then it goes out of the fluid layer uh, through the neighboring electrodes. And the whole uh, experiment is uh, submitted to a vertical magnetic field. Therefore, the, the radial current uh, above each electrode interacts with uh, the vertical magnetic field to generate some uh, azimuthal force. And this drives a vortex uh, an, or more precisely, an array of counter rotating vortices, uh, each vortex being above one electrode. So, this is the picture on the bottom, bottom left, displays the flow uh, when the forcing is small and the flow is laminar. You just observe this array of counter rotating vortices uh, above the pattern of electrodes. So in fact, uh, this system uh, in the limit of uh, two-dimensional flows is governed by two-dimensionless parameters, because in fact, uh, for the full problem, there are four dimensionless parameters. But here, the, the magnetic Reynolds number is very small, and the Hartmann number is very large. So at the end, we, have, we are left for the vertically average velocity. We have left with a Navier-Stokes equation with the usual uh, Reynolds number, uh, plus the forcing, the periodic forcing, f of x and y. And the new term, uh, which results from the vertical average, uh, is uh, some large scale dissipation, so proportional to the, the fluid velocity, and uh, with a factor one over Rh, was, where Rh is a dimensionless number, uh, which is uh, given by the characteristic velocity times the characteristic time divided by a characteristic length. And uh, the Reynolds, these two Reynolds numbers, are related to the, the experimental parameters, so the current I and the magnetic field B in different ways, such that we can modify them independently by changing either the injection current or the, the magnetic field. In all these experiments, the Reynolds number is large. So in fact, the control parameter is RH, so it's the inverse of the large scale friction. So when uh, we increase RH, so when we decrease the large scale friction, uh, the nice periodic pattern is destabilized. You see here one of the first bifurcation, which correspond to pairing uh, of vortices with the same similar signs. And, uh, when you, you keep decreasing the, uh, this large scale friction, you generate some flow, some 
uh, turbulent flow in which you can see that you have vortices of different sizes and uh, on the lower time recording of the velocity you can see that you have some uh, chaotic velocity field so when uh, in fact we first uh, reach this uh, uh, this turbulent regime uh, we observe that the probability density function of the velocity is uh, uh, roughly a Gaussian. And uh, we will use uh, this probability density of the velocity uh, to characterize the first transition, which occurs when we decrease further the large scale friction. So what you observe is that when we decrease further the large scale friction, we have a transition from a Gaussian PDF to a bimodal PDF with two maxima. Uh, so the simplest way to analyze the data is to consider that uh, this uh, uh, PDF, the full PDF, is described by two Gaussian PDFs, which are uh, symmetric uh, about zero and shifted by some, uh, some value delta, I, delta dx here. So we, we write the PDF, the full PDF as the sum of two Gaussian. And what we, what we observe is that the variance of these two Gaussian in red here stays constant when the RH is varied, whereas uh, the distance from zero of uh, these two uh, Gaussians, dx, it increases as a square root here in the inset dx square is plotted. So dx square increase linearly with the uh, distance to the threshold of this bifurcation. So in fact, here we, we can, using this PDF, we can characterize some continuous bifurcation from a, a flow with a Gaussian PDF to a, a flow with a bimodal PDF as RH is changed. Uh, when, uh, when RH is decreased further, uh, this bimodality becomes stronger. And uh, you see here on this time recording of the velocity field that uh, uh, the, the, you, you clearly observe the bimodality without uh, plotting any probability density function. Uh, the system, in fact, jumps uh, randomly between two states with uh, opposite uh, large scale velocity. And in fact, these two states correspond to, uh, correspond to two states with a large, scale, a large scale velocity, a large scale circulation velocity with different signs, uh, just uh, with uh, blue arrows. So the bimodality is related to random reversals of uh, a, a large scale, uh, the largest scale mode possible in the system, which is a large scale circulation uh, on the scale of the full uh, domain. Uh, so I think that well, uh, I will skip that because it, time is running and it's fact, it's not so interesting because it, it mostly shows that uh, it's unfortunately not possible to use uh, a low dimensional dynamical system to, to describe these reversals. Uh, <clears throat> so I will shortly mention uh, uh, some numerical simulation done by some postdoc, Pankaj Mishra, a few years ago on this problem. Uh, when you when you simulate 
the two dimension Navier Stokes equation with a space periodic forcing, uh, increasing RH, you observe, in fact, the, exactly the same similar transitions as in the experiment. You start from a, a perfectly periodic pattern. You have a, this pattern is destabilized through a sequence of bifurcations. Then you, uh, you reach a state in which you have some turbulent 2D turbulent flow with vortices with different sizes. And at the end, uh, for very large RH, you observe the condensate. So you mostly observe uh, a large scale circulation uh, within the flow. And uh, if we look at if we look at the time recording of the velocity in this simulation, we observe exactly the same feature as in the experiment. Uh, we start here uh, from uh, fluctuations which are Gaussian. So the PDFs are shown on the, the right picture. And then when you increase RH, so decrease large scale friction, we we observe this transition from Gaussian to bimodal. When we increase our age further, the bimodality becomes stronger. And uh, at the end, there is another transition that we also observe in experiments. Uh, when RH, RH is increased further, at some point, the system stops reversing and it just chooses one sign uh, in an arbitrary way chooses one sign of the large scale circulation and you observe only one part of the PDF or the other, but you don't observe any more reversals between the, the two polarities. So uh, at this stage, uh, the summary of the results is that both the experiment and the direct simulation of two-dimensional Navier-Stokes uh, display the same transitions. So we have two transitions between uh, uh, turbulent flows, one from a Gaussian PDF to a bimodal PDF, and then a second transition uh, for which reversals stop. And uh, we observe a condensate with a given sign of the large scale circulation. So uh, now I will try to, uh, to convince you that uh, these transitions, the two transitions can be described uh, using equilibrium statistical mechanics. So uh, then we, we will show that equilibrium statistical mechanics uh, apply not only for uh, large scale spectra, for explaining large scale spectra in turbulent flows, but can be also used to uh, describe uh, uh, bifurcations between different turbulent flows, which involves large scale modes. So uh, uh, we, to, to try to describe these transitions, uh, we will try. We will use uh, the truncated, the two D truncated Euler equation, and we will truncate at the forcing wave number. The idea is that since we are dealing with uh, large scale quantities, we are interested in large scales. Uh, fact and since also dissipation is not very effective at large scale, one possibility is just to forget dissipation, to forget the forcing, so to, uh, to end up on the 2D Euler equation and to truncate it at the forcing wave number in order to keep only the large scales. So it, it, seems, it, it seems really unlikely to to obtain, uh, uh, to obtain some sensible result doing that. 
And in fact, I should say that uh, we, we observed that more or less by accident. Uh, and we were first very surprised to, to observe that this type of description can, uh, can make possible the understanding of these transitions. So for the truncated uh, 2D other equation, we have two quadratic invariants, which are the energy and the Hans trophy. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, we will use uh, these invariants uh, as a bifurcation parameter. Because in, in the full simulations, we have seen that the bifurcation parameter is uh, this dimensionless number RH. And RH, in fact, determines, it's a large scale friction, so it determines the wave number at which the inverse cascade will stop. Uh, in fact, using energy and Hans trophy, we can also construct a wave number, uh, Kc squared, given by the Hans trophy divided by the energy, which is also the wave number at which the inverse cascade stops. And uh, what is displayed on this figure for two different Reynolds numbers is the relation between this wave number Kc and uh, RH. So we see that we have more or less a one-to-one -one relation between Kc and RH. And so the idea is to use the ratio of Hans trophy divided by energy in the 2D Euler equation, truncated Euler equation, to describe the, the transitions observed experimentally and in direct simulations. So uh, <clears throat> the results are displayed here. I have recalled the, uh, the direct the results of the direct numerical simulation on uh, the left and uh, on the right you have the results uh, given by the truncated uh, Euler equation when we change the wave number k sub c by changing the energy to Hans trophy ratio of the initial conditions. So what you see is that you have you, you observe exactly the same the same transitions. You you start with a fluctuating uh, velocity field, which is uh, which has a Gaussian PDF. Uh, then when you uh, change k sub c, uh, you you reach a situation with a small bimodality. Then this bimodality becomes stronger. And finally, uh, the system stops reversing uh, in the, the last uh, recording. So you see that we have a, a good, uh, we, at least qualitatively, we, we do observe the same transitions using the truncated Euler equation. So a system which uh, is, uh, is at statistical equilibrium. The truncated Euler equation can be uh, described uh, in the, using the microcanonical ensemble as a, a system at statistical equilibrium. And we see that we are able to predict the transitions between different turbulent flows just using uh, this truncated Euler equation. So uh, a system at statistical equilibrium. So here we, uh, we to look if, if this, uh, uh, this description is robust, we have decreased the number of modes. Uh, and uh, uh, you see that uh, this, this is shown on the, for the PDFs on the right. Uh, in fact, you can very strongly uh, decrease the number of modes, uh, so uh, truncate the system more and more, and uh, down to certain modes, we still observe the same, the same bifurcations, the same transitions 
when we change the ratio uh, of uh, energy to to anstrophy so we we do observe similar transition gaussian to bimodal and bimodal to uh, a system that stops uh, reversing uh, in fact uh, here's the the dash the dashed line uh, represents uh, the prediction of the probability density function precisely using uh, statistical mechanics of the 2D truncated Euler equation within the framework of the, the microcanonical ensemble. It, it does not give more information because it's much simpler to, to simulate the truncated Euler equations and to, to compute this PDF and this should be no, done anyway numerically, but uh, in fact, the, the microcanonical ensemble gives you the, the right uh, result for the, the probability density function uh, of uh, this system. So I will I will skip this. And maybe if I can take a few more minutes, uh, I will discuss now uh, uh, the situation uh, for the, the low frequency behavior of different turbulent flows. And I will start with uh, I will start with the flow, this two-dimensional flow we uh, we have just uh, described. And I will go back to, to this picture of the velocity uh, recording versus time. Uh, so now when, when, we, when we look at the, the temporal spectrum of uh, this recording, we, we get this uh, here, this black power spectrum uh, with clearly two different slopes and the transition roughly correspond to the forcing scale. And what you see is that below the forcing scale, you have some, uh, uh, something which uh, seems to, to increase towards the low frequencies. And it seems to be uh, very similar to what people are calling one over F noise. So the, the red line, is something, uh, it's not exactly one over F, but it's F to the power minus 0.8. So, uh, and in fact, we have observed that in many turbulent flows, uh, the low frequency spectrum is not flat, as uh, expected from, as could be expected from naive arguments uh, uh, from signal processing, but it displays this, uh, this one over F type behavior. So uh, what, what we have performed to try to understand why there is this one over F behavior, we have looked at the spectrum uh, of the absolute value of the velocity, uh, which is flatter, it is in blue, it's flatter than uh, the, the spectrum of the velocity itself. And we have looked at the spectrum of the sign of the velocity. So in fact, uh, uh, so when the velocity is positive, you put plus one. And when the velocity is negative, you put minus one. And you compute the spectrum. You see that the spectrum of the sign is very similar to the, at low frequency, of course, it's very similar to the spectrum of the, the full uh, velocity field. And so we, uh, this shows that, uh, in fact, uh, this change of changes of sign, so the reversals, uh, seems seem to be important to understand the low frequency behavior of the spectrum. Uh, so in fact, uh, for for simple, uh, for simple uh, time behavior like that, uh, 
it has been known since a long time that you have some relation between the spectrum and the probability density of tau, uh, where tau is the waiting time between successive events. So if I consider the case B, uh, which is our case, so you have some, some signal which jump from plus one to minus one in a random way. Uh, these people have shown that, uh, in fact, the, the exponent of the spectrum, uh, say alpha, is such that alpha plus beta, the exponent of the probability density for the waiting times, so the sum of alpha plus, be plus beta is three. So this is not a very difficult calculation. It can be done in one page, roughly. Uh, and uh, in fact, we do observe we do observe that in uh, our experiments. Uh, here, what is plotted is the probability density of the waiting time. So uh, the best fit gives beta equals two point twenty five. And uh, on, uh, on the right, we, we have plotted the exponent uh, of the, the exponent of the spectrum and the exponent of the waiting time probability density function. And you see that alpha plus beta, indeed, it's roughly about the value which is uh, predicted theoretically for this for uh, this very simple telegraph signal. So I will skip that. We, we observed, in fact, so this relation between probability density of waiting times and low frequency spectrum of the turbulent flow uh, has been observed with several different systems. We have observed it uh, in a in a shear flow, uh, and uh, we have observed it uh, for the magnetic field in the dynamo experiment, which also displays burst, and we have also observed that for the pressure field in von Kármán flow. In all these cases, uh, you have some kind of coherent structures. So some, uh, some events in the two-dimensional turbulence case, these events are just change of sign uh, of the large scale velocity. For instance, in the pressure of a three-dimensional turbulent flow, these events are pressure de depressions, so bursts, uh, which also occurs randomly in time. For the dynamo experiment, uh, these events are bursts of magnetic field generated just above the dynamo threshold. And in all these systems, we have the relation between the low frequency spectrum and uh, the probability density of the waiting time of these coherent structures, which are observed in a random way. So uh, I will conclude since. Uh, I am uh, uh, above my time. Uh, so in fact, it seems at least in all these examples, it seems that uh, the low frequency behavior of uh, our turbulent flows is strongly related to the dynamics uh, of coherent structures, uh, which occur in a random way and so, the PDF of the waiting time uh, of these coherent structures gives you the exponent of the low frequency spectrum of the turbulent flow. So uh, to conclude, I hope that uh, I have convinced you that scales larger than the forcing scale uh, of turbulent flows uh, are in statistical equilibrium at least in, in all the examples we, we studied. Uh, transitions 
between different turbulent regimes can be studied as bifurcations of the probability density function, and they can be modeled uh, using the truncated Euler equation. So they can be modeled by a system which, which is at statistical equilibrium. And the low frequency behavior of turbulent flows is apparently often related to the dynamics of uh, coherent structures. Thank you. So thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation. So I would say we can open the stage for questions. We already have someone who wants to ask a question. So just feel free Alan, to, unmute your, to unmute your mic and uh, pose your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to ask specifically with regard to 3D Navier-Stokes, if you uh, force Navier-Stokes just at a Reynolds number of order unity, I would imagine that uh, you would expect the uh, statistical equilibrium at the um, uh, low wave numbers. And is the statement that it exists even in high wave numbers, I mean, even in high Reynolds number, uh, uh, saying basically that the inertial range uh, is not influencing the low wave number range, which could be a reflection of uh, the locality of interactions. Yes, but uh, I, it, it's also, I think that it's also related to the fact that in 3D turbulence, uh, you don't have any uh, mean energy flux uh, between the, uh, the forcing scale and the largest scales in the box, in the domain. So, in fact, in contrast to the inertial scales, uh, the scales between the, the injection scale and the largest scale of the domain, uh, they, they are not, they, there is no energy, mean energy flux crossing these scales. So, uh, I think that it's, it's probably uh, an important reason for which these large scales are at statistical equilibrium. But uh, uh, in fact, we have some, uh, we do have some weak interaction between these scales. Since, uh, as I said, uh, if you look at the fluctuations, uh, you have fluctuations of the energy flux even within the large scales. Okay, but my point is, is that the, the same whether or not the forcing scale is it's a high Reynolds number forcing versus you know, an order one Reynolds number? Uh, but if, if if my Reynolds number is order one, uh, I I don't expect uh, I don't expect any fluctuations in the large scales. So uh, if my Reynolds number is too small, I don't expect uh, energy uh, within the largest scales. There is no reason. Uh, if the flow, if the Reynolds number is small and if the flow is laminar, I expect to have energy only uh, in the scales which are directly forced. Okay, so in that sense, there is some kind of a non-local interaction between the inertial range when you have high Reynolds number. Yes, the, the, the fluctuations at large scales uh, are, are related to a strongly non-local interaction. You, in fact, uh, you, you have two wave vectors separated with a very small angle uh, in the inertial scale, which are, which are non-linearly exciting uh, a very small wave vector, so at large scale. That, that sounds somewhat analogous to the uh, phenomenology of the triadic interactions within the inertial range. 
yes, but uh, uh, in a, yes, these are triadic interactions, but uh, in a very non-local way, you you have two two wave vectors with uh, with a large modulus, which interact with a wave vector with a very very small modulus. Okay. There is an analogy, at least. Okay, good. Thank you. So, is there someone else who wants to to ask a question? Just feel free to unmute your mic and uh, uh, ask your question if you if you have one. You can also write it in the chat, and uh, I can uh, I can read it. I have a quick question uh, for Stefan. Uh, this is Christos Basilikos uh, talking. Uh, right. You said that as the um, Rh number increases, you eventually get a second transition, uh, yes. in one in which you just get uh, uh, one peak. You lose. Uh, you just uh, you lose the bimodality. Yes. Uh, are you sure that this is the case? Could it be that you just don't in integrate for long enough time to see the other one? Yes, uh, it's a good question. Uh, so, uh, in uh, in fact, in that uh, uh, the mean waiting time is increasing exponentially uh, when. Uh, we, we go toward the regime without reversals. Uh, so it's clear that uh, uh, it's clear that it's a possibility that uh, we, we did not look at, we did not look at long enough time during long enough time to observe the, the reversals. Uh, in the truncated other equation case, uh, we can show that, uh, in fact, there is some uh, uh, there is some critical value uh, above which you you cannot have reversals anymore. So this could be a difference, by the way, between the uh, the truncated dollar equation and the direct simulation. Uh, it's, uh, in the direct simulation, we have no way to to claim that uh, uh, above some value of Rh, uh, we don't have uh, reversals anymore. So maybe, uh, maybe we have just to wait uh, for the, the life of the universe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, and one other question, perhaps a silly one. You said that the uh, wave number where the inverse cascade stops in your 2D truncated Euler equation uh, was determined by the ratio of entropy to energy. Yes. I assume this is the average wave number, and this wave number is, is a fluctuating quantity? Uh, in reality? And is that is that relevant? Perhaps it's just relevant? It's a... Uh, I think it... Is it a, it's certainly a fluctuating quantity, yes. Uh, and in fact, I just said that uh, this ratio of, uh, of on's trophy to energy is, is in fact just an estimate of, uh, of the wave number at which the inverse cascade stops. Uh, otherwise, yes, it's clearly, uh, uh, it's clearly a fluctuating quantity. Uh, but um, in fact, we just used uh, this ratio uh, as a bifurcation parameter uh, in the case of a truncated dollar equation because we, since we have removed uh, uh, we have removed forcing and dissipation, we we need some bifurcation parameter. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, I just have a quick question regarding the, actually it's an add-on to the first question of Christos. Uh, when you uh, when you lose the um, the bimodality, may it be that your system became so sensitive to small perturbation that basically, as um, like your uh, your experimental uh, setup is driving uh, one uh, is uh, driving towards one of the of the unstable uh, configurations. Yes, it. Um... It exactly like uh, in, uh, in fact, it's exactly like in any bifurcation in which you have a broken symmetry. Uh, when when we lose bimodality, uh, it, it, in fact, we but we can understand with a dynamical system approach. We can understand uh, this transition. Uh, has a situation in, in which the, the, you have two symmetric parts in the phase space of the system. Uh, these, symmetric, these symmetric parts are, are connected with, uh, by some trajectories, possible trajectories. And uh, when we change a parameter, at some point, these connected trajectories disappear. So, uh, so in fact, depending on uh, in which part you are when you cross this transition, uh, you stay uh, on one side or the other. So it's it, it just like uh, uh, any situation, any bifurcation, even in uh, uh, in much simpler systems in which you have a broken symmetry. Uh, in fact, uh, the solution which is uh, which is chosen depends on the uh, on the initial conditions, uh, and uh, so you have anyway you have to choose one of them. Yeah, and, then, and 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 then like keep thinking on the like uh, dynamic system interpretation of of the. Of the instability, actually, it would it, imagine that you jump on the other side of the uh, of the bifurcation diagram. Uh, yes. In that case, if you track it, if you trace it back, like reducing the parameter uh, up to which you lose uh, by model uh, instability, then uh, the bimodal instability, then it would be uh, possible in this sense to check. If you have a symmetric branching of the system or not, and then if you don't have it, basically those would be a test for the sensitivity of the instability to uh, small defects in the experiment, right? Uh, yes, if uh, uh, even uh, in fact, if you have a if you have a small defect of symmetry in the experiment, uh, you you will you will always observe the, the same the same large scale circulation, the same sign of the large scale circulation when you you, you will lose uh, when when the system will stop reversing. Yeah. So yes, this is true. Uh, in fact, uh, in our experiments, we we observed uh, both signs of the, the large scale circulation when we when we crossed this this last transition. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's good. Um, okay. So let's let's see if there is someone else who wants to. To ask okay. a may, may I ask a question? Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, I um, want to ask this uh, non-local interaction, backscattering sort of uh, behavior. So this uh, local frequency behavior and the larger scales, they are more or less the same thing, right? Different aspects. One is that 
temporal spatial aspect of this same kind of fluctuations? Are they not? Uh, I don't understand what is the same. Uh, okay, you said uh, scales larger than the forcing, larger scale fluctuations, and then you have low frequency behaviors. So yes. these are two aspects of uh, more or less a similar type of uh, fluctuations, are they not? Uh, Can low frequency behavior correspond to larger scale behavior? Yes, they, uh, in some sense they are related, but you see uh, there is some important difference uh, in the time domain. Uh, we we do have a spectrum at a frequency as low as you, we want. It just mm -hmm. depends on the, uh, yeah, the duration okay, yes. of the experiment. Yes, uh, yeah. In the spatial domain, you, you have, don't you have, have a cutoff, anything. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I understand that. Uh, okay, so these are uh, low frequency or larger scale. They they were driven, as you mentioned, by by high, high wave number components through this kind of triadic interactions. But uh, yeah. uh, you, what, what kind of range those uh, driving components are in? Are they, are they, are they comparable? They, are they in the uh, forcing or, or, or smaller than forcing? Uh, I think that they... Uh, the most efficient uh, scales are close to the forcing scale. Uh -huh. uh, you mean the uh, scales smaller than forcing, this kind of triadic interactions are not uh, very effective? Uh, it's, um, I cannot prove that, but... Uh, I think that the most effective, uh, uh, the most effective scales, uh, giving energy to the largest scales, are close to the forcing scales. Yeah. Well, you you can you can you 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 can prove this numerically, right? So if you uh, decrease the cutoff or increase the and then the low frequency or low wave number part is not affected. Then. Yes, that's right. In fact, there is a, there is some work with uh, by uh, Alexakis and Brache, who have uh, who have studied that to some extent. They uh, they have modified the the spectrum of the close to the forcing scales. Okay. And they have looked at the, uh, the effect on the largest scale. Okay. Thank you. So any more questions? Um, can, I, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, um, uh, it's a very small question. Initially, you showed that the the, the large scales that you showed this equipartition, that there is a negative and positive flux. They're not completely cut off from the cascade. On the mean, the flux is zero. Yes. These negative and positive flux events, are these random or are these quasi-periodical or... They no, no, they are random. They're random. Yes, they are random. In fact, uh, yes, yes. In fact, even in uh, and uh, even in the inertial range, you 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 have uh, you have flux uh, positive and negative in a random way. Yeah, yeah. In the inertial range, yes. Uh, but I was just wondering about the large scales. If it's random or okay, it's random. Yes, so, it's random. So even if you did ensemble averaging and not time averaging, the spectral slope would be exactly the same, in a sense. Uh, if 
if I do, I don't understand. If I do, uh, if, if I do if, ensemble averaging of what? If if you are in the inner, it's a periodic box turbulence, isn't it? Yes. If uh, you calculated uh, your spectrum, you calculate it on a time average domain or in an instantaneous. No, no, it's time averaged. Okay. So but, even if. Uh, but what I displayed in gray, for instance, is uh, is the instantaneous energy flux. Yes, yes, I understand. So even if you calculated um, um, a velo the velocity field, um, if you um, Yeah, uh, if you calculated uh, the wave number, the energy spectrum across wave numbers, but in an ensemble averaged way. So this is what you presented, not in a time average sense, in an ensemble average sense. You perform the same simulation many times. The yes. result would be, you would say that the result would be exactly the same in the spectral slope. Oh yes, I think so, but uh, but this should be done. <laughs> but uh, I don't see why I can expect a different result. No, no okay. That's it. Yeah, thank you very much. There is a question. Uh, there are two questions actually um, reported in the chat. Uh, so uh, the reversal between uh, well-defined large-scale structures is uh, shaping the low frequency, uh, so low k part of the spectrum. So can this spectral shaping uh, be seen as a non-universal end effect of the boundaries? In, uh, in other words, the low K spectrum expected to be very specific to each boundary condition. So, uh, the low K spectrum, uh, is it? Yes, probably if, uh, if I perform an experiment, uh, uh, for instance, uh, if the boundary condition are anisotropic, certainly this, uh, this will affect the, the low K spectrum. Uh, this, this is clear. Uh, but uh, then, as usual, uh, uh, in fact, what you, what you hope. Uh, Yes, what certainly if if you look at the the first modes, the first allowed modes in your in your box, they, they will certainly be non-universal and uh, they, they will be uh, related to to the boundary conditions. Uh, so the only problem, and it's the reason for which this. Uh, uh, this topic has not been studied uh, experimentally. So, uh, in fact, the only problem is to have uh, a large enough range between the forcing scale and the scale of the domain. So, uh, uh, and this is a difficult part, both in experiments and numerical simulation. I if I have a factor, uh, uh, if I have a factor 10 between the forcing scale and the scale of the domain, uh, certainly I will not be able to, to observe a universal spect low, low K spectrum on one decade. Uh, but uh, if I have a factor 1000 between the forcing scale and, and the scale of the domain, then uh, probably uh, I 
on one decade, I will not be affected too much by, by, uh, by the boundary conditions. So, uh, I think that the, the only clear answer to that is to, to try to have experiments and, uh, and to look at uh, to look at the behavior, but in the numerical simulations, uh, you see, we we did not observe uh, we do, did not observe some problems related to, uh, to the fact that we we have in a, we are in a cubic cubic box with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, And uh, related to, to to the same uh, uh, topic, like do large scale reversal have detectable signatures on the high frequency and high wave number of the spectrum? Uh, I think the answer is no, but uh, at least we we have not. We have not detected anything like that. Uh, but uh, this does not mean that nothing exists. Uh, okay. I don't know what, uh, what do you have in mind? Uh, uh, what can be affected uh, by large, by reversals uh, in, the, in the small scale range. Uh, Maybe I can try to be more specific if my mic is working. Yes. Yes. Uh, for example, if you have very long time scales, which appears, yes, this, because this reversal occurs on on the last on time scale, which could uh, di diverge, for example, then you will not be able to average properly the the inertial scales, and it will have some convergence problem, for example, of a problem which could arise. Ah, uh, yes, but. Uh... <clears throat> Yes, but uh, if I if I look, uh, this is true. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, yes, this is true. But this is more a problem to to estimate, for instance, uh, to estimate large scale quantities. This is a real problem to observe uh, to, to describe the the behavior of the the mean duration between successive reversals. Because of course, for the, when we are very close to the point at which the reversals stop, or at least at which we do not observe any more uh, reversals, uh, when we are close to this situation, uh, we have a very small number of reversals on the duration of the experiment. And then uh, it, it's not possible to, to evaluate correctly the mean duration between reversals. But concerning, uh, concerning small scale quantities, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I, I can very easily compute, uh, for instance, structure functions. Uh, related to velocity increment. I can very easily compute them uh, on a situation with reversals, on a situation without reversals, or I can compute them on, uh, for one polarity of the, the, the large scale flow or for the other polarity. And uh, I think that I will not observe any difference. 
Merci. OK. OK, so uh, if there are no other questions, I think uh, um, we can uh, we can uh, close the seminar and let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you for the very interesting talk and uh, for the number of uh, uh, questions which uh, it generated, uh, the discussion uh, and for replying to so many questions. So thank you a lot. Thank you. Have a good evening. Uh, bye.